the topic of today's lecture is going to be how we control microbial growth. And what we're going to be discussing are the different mechanisms in which we are capable of affecting the growth of microorganisms. We're going to be looking at bacteria in general. We're also going to be taking a look at prokaryotes, at eukaryotes, excuse me, as another one of the uh, topics in the lecture. So part of the issue is that, as you know, why do we want to control their growth? Well, you know, they cause disease in us and in animals. Those of you thinking about veterinary medicine, you know that there's going to be a lot of pathogens that are going to be affecting our pets, as well as people. They're also a major source of spoilage of food. So controlling the way in which microorganisms can grow in our food is going to allow that food to be used for us in the longer term. Just look at my fridge, if you were to see, and the lovely cultures that I am growing at all times because I am lazy about controlling how microbes in my fridge deal with this. I like to have my pet microbes, I think it is the issue. And as you may imagine, um, there are detrimental effects on the environment of microorganisms. I was talking to some people during the Thanksgiving break about the red tide that is currently happening and the algae that are coming up in great numbers causing the red tie, which has a toxin, and therefore affecting animals that are living in it and people. So as this basically indicates, we have adverse economics effects on the biomedical, agricultural, dairy, wine, food, and silk industry. Do any of you remember why the silk industry? Why would it be detrimental to make cloth? Yes? Yeah, it's part of the issue about the silkworms. They, Pasteur actually solved the issue with the silkworms because the silkworms in France during his time were actually dying. And in those days, the Silk Road to Asia was being cut by China. So saving the French silk industry by determining that there was a fungal infection affecting the pupae of the uh, silkworm um, address that issue. So that actually changed a little bit of the course of history. So if you want to see a really cool movie, it's called The Silk Road, I believe it is. It's a book as well that talks about, excuse me, that talk about this issue. So when we think about controlling microbes, we can do them in multiple different ways. We can decontaminate an environment, which basically it's going to reduce the number of organisms making it quote unquote safe. What we, keep, what we keep doing, whenever we do the sanitizer in our hands, it's decontaminating to make it safe. Disinfection, it's going to be a different way to target microbial growth. And in that way, what we're doing, it's removing most of the pathogens, but not really removing a lot of the microorganisms. And that's why we use bleach. If you look at any of the, like I was, I was coaching CrossFit a couple of days ago, and we ran out of the lemon disinfectant, and in, when I was looking to see how they diluted, the first thing that it comes, it kills HIV, and it kills pneumococcus, and it kills all these other things. So you're trying to remove the pathogens that could be involved, but not really, in a sense, we're not thinking about all the microbes that may be involved. But the only way to actually get rid of all the microorganisms is by sterilization. So we tend to use these terms intermingly, but when we think biologically speaking, they're not. You have decontamination, disinfection, and sterilization, and all of them are different. Now, when we want to uh, remove microorganisms, we can do it physically. And when we physically remove the organisms, we can either kill them by heat, we can kill them by radiation, or we can kill them or remove them by sterilization, by, excuse me, filter sterilization. And as you may think, you know what? Every time that we go into the lab and we autoclave something, we are using heat to remove that potential pathogen. When mothers are using the pressure cooker in their homes to sterilize the bottles of their babies, when they put them in the pressure cooker, we use steam, they are using heat sterilization, removing the microorganisms so then the food, for example, in the baby bottle doesn't spoil. Uh, even though the baby will drop it in the ground eventually, but at least the content inside will not be bad. The outside, we don't care as much. Now, radiation is the other way, and here we can use some kind of ionizing radiation to reduce the growth of microorganisms. And depending on the kind of radiation that we use, that could be just a very so surface decontamination, or it could be deep. And we'll talk about that later. And last, filter sterilization, as you may, it's just using a filter, a filter that is going to remove the microorganisms from the environment. And as you remember, at least the filters that we were using earlier in the beginning of the century 
um, last century, excuse me, were not able to remove viruses. So now we have actually better filters that are able to do that. So when we think about heat sterilization, we are basically are thinking, you know what, we're going to apply high temperatures to denature the organism's proteins. And when the proteins are denatured, they are not able to live. So you want to basically cook it. So you want to use a temperature and a time, because maybe different organisms have different susceptibilities according to that. Think about a thermophilic microorganism. Thermophilus aquaticus that is growing at 100 degrees will laugh to you if you try to use 100 degree uh, temperature to kill it. E. coli, on the other hand, is very sensitive to that temperature. So you have to take into consideration the biology of the microorganisms every time that you're doing a disinfectant or sterilization mechanism. And this graph over here, what it's basically showing us is the different susceptibility of microorganisms to heat. This is looking at what is termed the decimal reduction time, or D. And that is basically the time that it takes a colony to go down to 10%. So basically a log is what we're looking at. So here you start with 100% and look at the time that if you put this particular culture at 50 degrees, it's going to take 40 minutes to achieve that reduction in time. But if you then take that microorganism and cook it now at 70 degrees, it takes less than 10 minutes to do the same issue. So the biology of the organism is going to dictate what temperature is going to reduce it. So scientists have gone down and determined the decimal reduction time at different temperatures to know how much of exposure to heat a microorganism may need to reduce it to that 10%. And what we can look at is that that optimal reduction time can vary with temperature depending if you have a mesophile or a thermophile bacteria. As I mentioned, E. coli will die very quickly for example, compared to a hyperthermophile microorganism that is living on a hot spring and is able to resist the high temperatures of um, the environment. And as we discussed also, the microorganisms have way to escape. Some of them do. Think about all the gram-positive spore-forming microorganisms. We talked about the fact that the spores are extremely good at resisting temperature. So those microorganisms need to be... Uh, carefully monitor to ensure that the spores that they are generated are not going to allow them to survive. And as we discussed in class, that is the, be the basic problem of canning with botulism. That you're using the temperature to try to sterilize the food and render it uh, preserved for later, but the microorganism has gone into a spore state. And therefore, it can sustain the temperature change that you're using to cook the food, and later that spores germinate and is able to contaminate this food and therefore release the toxin that is going to cause botulism. So you have to be careful in that when you're considering the microorganisms. And as we talked about, the autoclave is the tool that we use in lab to make sure that those um, instruments or food or, um, actually not food, you could put the, uh, sorry, not food, thinking about um, instruments and things like to put food um, are going to be used. So for example, as you can see, the autoclave, it is a pressure chamber that is going to allow temperature to go above 100 degree uh, Celsius in water. As you increase the pressure, the temperature can actually go down, so you can go to 120 degrees temperature of water and stay remain as vapor. And what is important about it is that the pressure doesn't do anything to the organism. It's actually the temperature that you're having. And for example, my colleagues that work in dental offices, they have tiny little autoclaves that they can use to sterilize their instruments. So the autoclave doesn't have to be a big gigantic monster. You can actually feel a coffin inside. It could be a small instrument that is going to allow, again, because you're bringing that temperature up to over 120 degrees, which usually is very good to um, um, eliminate most microorganisms by sterilization. So remember, sterilization is the complete elimination of the organisms, including oftentimes the spores. So the other part that we want to think about heat, it's the process of pasteurization. And as the name implies, that was designed by Louis Pasteur in France, and it is a controlled process in which the temperature is going to be reached to, again, reduce the amount of organisms present in a sample. The milk that we drink is usually pasteurized. The eggs that you get already, like if you get the egg whites coming on in a little carton, they are pasteurized. And we consider them to be microorganisms safe. We don't think about it too much. So this is extremely good because all those 
materials are liquids. And liquids tend to be denatured really easily when you're thinking about temperature. So it doesn't kill all the organisms, but it's going to re reduce them. So you have to put multiple um, measures in place to reduce the load of the microorganism in the liquid. So having the area disinfected, that reduces the organism amount that the liquid could be exposed to. And after that, then you can top of that with sterilization, like in the case of pasteurization. Yes, Anne? It's the, how liable labels, excuse me, the liquid is. You cannot sterilize a liquid that you are hoping to keep in an active um, biological form. Oh. Yeah. If you don't care about issues, like that's how we do it, for example, with the bacterial uh, liquids that we use, the media, we sterilize it in the autoclave. We don't pasteurize it because we don't care that the proteins are intact in there. We just want the proteins to be there so the microorganisms release their exoenzymes, break those proteins down, and then transfer the amino acids. But if you want those proteins to be biologically active, you have to think about a temperature that is not going to denature those proteins. And pasteurization, for example, is going to be a good way of doing that. The best way to actually do that is with filtration. Filtration will be the best way to and the most gentle way to remove microorganisms without affecting the biological activity of the molecules that you have present in the sample. So heat can kill most of anything. We know it. So if you ever got into a bind, a little bit of vodka in that knife, flame it. If you need to do surgery, you can help get something out of somebody. Like I've seen people do that with hooks when they go fishing. Somebody come in, disinfect with alcohol, light it up with the lighter, clean that up, the heat has destroyed the microorganism, and they can remove the hook after that. You look like, Ugh. yeah, it's pretty scary. I saw that doing it on an eye. It was, it was very, yeah. Yeah, the guy was an expert. He did it well, but anyway. The other way to remove organisms and reduce the load of them is going to be by radiation. And here now we're going to be looking at the amount of energy that that radiation has. As you know, the lower the wavelength, is it higher or lower energy? This lower the wavelength, is it higher energy or lower energy? Say that loud. Higher energy. So as we're moving from UV light, X-ray, and gamma ray, the increase of energy that that um, radiation is going to have. And like in this image here, we have the typical hood that we all had seen in our science labs. And that is using ultraviolet light to disinfect the area on the surface. As we discussed in, uh, in the molecular part of the class, UV light can cause thymidine dimers that will induce mutation in the organisms and reduce their load. But the thing is, is that you can protect against UV light by having a physical barrier. Those of you working in a lab, you have seen most likely the tip boxes that some people leave in their hood and they begin to crack on the surface as the UV light is beginning to destroy the polymer. Anyway, if there are microorganisms in the tips below it, they are being protected because the lid of the plastic is taking the brunt of the UV radiation. So the microorganism will be just protected underneath that series. So if I were to put a piece of paper, the organisms that are between the paper and the metal in this hood will be protected from UV light. The ones on top of it will die, but the one below it will survive. So UV radiation, it's only good to sterilize surfaces and reduce the amount of microbes on that surface. Well, that's when we come now with ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation, now we're talking about X-rays and gamma rays because they are going to cause a lot of biophysical problems like um, radicals, oxygen radicals, hydroxyl radicals, hydride radicals that now can attack DNA break inducing double-stranded DNA breaks as well as radiation and that can now lead to the death of the cell especially when we use them at very high doses. As we discussed the organisms are going to have mechanisms of repairing their genomes but if you induce a large number of double-stranded DNA breaks that is going to be unrepairable by the microorganism and therefore they are not going to be able to survive. That's why the principle of using radiation in, ca in cancer therapy. The same issue, donating sufficient double-stranded DNA breaks to therefore prevent the cell from repairing them. 
So the thing is, is that depending on the amount of radiation, you're going to see that organisms are more susceptible than others. And when we think about it, we can get radiation from x-ray tubes, we can get them from radionucleotides and a lot of different uh, sources. And it's constantly used in both the medical and food industry. So for example, the World Health Organization has guidelines that we are using in the US to be able to sterilize hamburger, chicken meat, and other spices with radiation to reduce the amount of um, organisms in them. But the problem is that the organisms are quite resistant. So as you remember, the unit of radiation is the gray. Probably you're also learning about rats. But one rad, excuse me, one gray equals 100 rads. Now, let's start by taking that exposure to humans, a lethal exposure of radiation to humans is 10 gray. So 10 grays will kill a person by basically ablating the hematopoietic system of their bone and therefore not letting them able to produce neutrophils. They become neutropenic. They won't defend themselves. They die within two weeks. We do that to animals as well. Now, 10 grays. Let's look at, for example, a Clostridia botulinum, the microorganism that causes botulism. It resists 3,300 grays. Our susceptibility is 10. This microorganism is 3,300 grays. So the spores are extremely resistant to radiation. So therefore, Clostridium botulism, even in radiated environments, with the amount of radiation that could kill a human, will basically laugh and survive. So you have to think about this. Um, e. coli has a 300 gray radiation limit. So the radiation that could kill us will not harm E. coli. They will be able to survive it. If we think now about other pathogens, like the foot and mouth virus that we talked about earlier in the virology class, 13,000 grays to be able to eliminate it from a solution. So as you see, depending on the microorganism, they will have a huge amount of resistance to radiation because they have really good ways of repairing their DNA as well. So one of the things, just like we discussed about the, um, the, the temperature time that is going to reduce the amount of organism by 10%, we have the same level in radiation. So we call that D10 over there. So how much is going to be to bring you back, how much radiation you will need in grace to bring the population to back to 10% survival. So this is a measure that we can think about in temperature, but it's also a measure that we can think about it in relationship to radiation. Yes, Chandra. Um, so with humans, you said it would take about two weeks necessarily before the person would die. Yeah. What's the delay look like in like a lot of the microorganisms as far as like, you know, you expose them to that level of radiation? It presumably doesn't take them a full two weeks to die. Part of the problem is the, it doesn't take them as long because of the high division rate that they have. Our cells are not dividing at the same speed as some of the microorganisms that we're attacking. So before they can rip, um, our cells survive for that long quote unquote because our cell division takes between 24 to <coughs> three, uh, 72 hours, depending on the cell type that you're looking at, giving us. Um, giving that cell a longer resistant to the radiation. They will be given a lethal dose of radiation, but they will persist. But when they start to divide, that's when they die. The microorganisms, because they are dividing faster, they're not able to repair at those high levels of radiation, their genome, and therefore they have partial problems of genome being fragmented, not getting all the genes, they die a lot quicker. I think that it takes both the issue because depending on the mechanism of DNA repair and how, as we learn in Bio 110, how the cell cycle in eukaryotes could be stopped based on double-stranded DNA damage and the repairing of that, um, that it will determine how resistant that organism is. For example, our hands, or solid tissue of the hands, the bones, is very resistant to radiation. So 
when I was in grad school, I was handling several grays of radiation with my hands behind the um, radioactive shield. And they gave me a ring to measure how much exposure I have. But the soft tissue in the gut, which is being replenished so quickly, is a lot more sensitive. So I needed to, you needed to be uh, behind the shield where the hands are exposed, where they can take it, because the skin, in particular the bone and the muscle, can resist radiation a lot more than the lining of the gut, for example. So there is a correlation between the turnover of the tissue being uh, the higher the turnover, the more sensitive it is. Basically is what it is. Did I answer your question? So that was for like multicellular eukaryotes? Yeah. Because it seems like a single cell would be able to, then there's a double-stranded break and it can just stop, whereas you can't just stop replacing the stomach tissue. True. Mm -hmm. Let's so talk about that yeah. after class. Okay. But I mean, I think that that is an awesome question and we'll address it a little later. Okay? Thank you. Now, especially for material that is sensitive, either liquids or gases that you do not want to have denature, you cannot heat them and you cannot irradiate them. So we use filtration. And basically, we had seen all kinds of filters in the lab. Here you have the filter right there in this bottle. There's a peristaltic pump shown here that is going to take the liquid that you want to uh, filter and pass it to the filter over there. Here is a syringe filter, and the filter is a mesh of very small sizes that is going to prevent the passage of a particle. It doesn't have to be a microorganism. It just has to be a particle, and it's only by size. So here, for example, we have a filter. Look at all the fibers within the filter. So therefore, particles can pass through there. Many big ones cannot pass through there, but the little ones can pass. Here in this kind of like Gruyere kind of cheese uh, filter looking, those are the holes that are going to allow the liquid to pass. And an organism, like shown over here, that is bigger than the hole gets stuck in the filter and therefore is not able to pass. So here is a five, micro mil, uh, five micron pore. So that is five microns, which is um, pretty large for a filter. Thinking that some microbes are actually about uh, two microns. And this one is the one that we tend to use most in the lab. It's the 0.2 micron filter. Notice how small the pores are. Here it is a spirochete bacteria that cannot really go through there, so therefore it gets stuck. Most of the viruses that we have are bigger than 0.2 microns, and therefore we can filter them out through this kind of mechanism using the right size of filter. When, we were, when I was working with viruses the, and we needed to remove bacteria, we will use the 0.45 micron filter. And if you needed to do with bacteria, we'll use the point two. You have a question, Daniel? Okay. Yes, wait. Are both of those sizes considered high efficiency, or would you have a limit on that size? Actually, no. The HEPA filter, which is this high efficiency particular L filter, it's um, 0.3 microns in size. So it's closer to this. But air doesn't really pass really well through this kind of filter. This is more of a liquid filter. So some of the vacuum cleaners, you've seen them in the hoods in the lab. Uh, all of them are equipped with a HEPA filter. And that removes about 99.9% .9 of the particles. When we set up the hoods in the lab, we put a particle counter. And basically, we never get a reading. But if you take it in the air, that thing goes like a Geiger counter, protesting that all the particles are coming along to it. Anyway, so we have the membranes to be able to remove the microorganisms. Now for the rest of the class, let's talk about the chemical as well as the biological control of microorganisms growth. And this is where I'm going to bring you three different terminologies. Something that is bacteriostatic, bacteriocidal, and bacteriolytic. So some of the compounds that we talk are bacteriostatic. They're basically inhibit growth. They're not killing the organism or destroying it. So this table, this graph over here, it's showing you a bacteriostatic compound in which you're measuring growth with time. At this point with the arrow, you add the compound. And as you see, what the viability stays the same. So there is no change in viability. The cells are not dying. But they're not dividing either. So you block the cell division of the cells. That is a bacteriostatic. And oftentimes what you're hoping to do is that the immune system of the creature, for example, and us, will take care of those organisms and remove them. 
you're preventing them from dividing, let's now remove them from the system by or defenses. Bactericidal uh, compounds are able to kill without destroying the cell. So over here, when you look at the total cell count and the viability, they're going up together. Once you add the bactericidal compound, the viability drops down because now the cells are dying, but they are not bursting. So the mechanisms that we're using to count particles stay the same. So you kill the organism, but you do not destroy the cell. Yes, Benita? So it will kill the cell, but do not destroy the actual membrane and cell wall. So you will have a little empty sac that can be counted using, for example, hemosatometer. Basically, yeah. And that's different from the bacteriolytic compounds that are actually able to burst the cell open. And in that state, what you see is that when you add them, both the cell count and the total cell count, the viability, excuse me, and the cell count both goes down. So in that way, you can have an antimicrobial agent that is either bacteriostatic, they basically prevent cell growth but do not kill the cell, they're bactericidal, that they kill the cell without destroying the actual cell. And you have bacteriolytic, which will actually burst the cell open. So when we're thinking about using a compound, an antibiotic, a chemical, we need to determine what is called the minimum inhibitory concentration. How much of this material do you need to add to prevent the culture from growing? And we tend to do a serial dilution experiment. So you will basically take a culture, inoculate the same amount of microorganisms in the culture, allow them to grow, but what you're changing is the concentration of the compound in the tube. And as you can see, you have, when you start to go in concentration, up in concentration, so this will be the more diluted and are the more concentrated, there's eventually a concentration where there is no growth whatsoever. And that point will be the minimum inhibitory concentration. So the smaller amount of a particular agent, be that a antibiotic or, for example, an antibody if you're trying to kill the cell, that is going to allow that cell to be destroyed. The other way that we can do this is by doing the disk diffusion assay, shown over here by this slide. And what we do is that we create a lawn of bacteria, and then we put a disc with a compound on it. That compound on it is going to diffuse from the disc into the agar of the media. And since it's diffusing, depending on the diffusion factor, it's going to create an area of clearance. So you can do it with multiple different dilutions of the uh, compound and see what dilution gives you clearance, or you can test multiple different compounds to see which one of them diffuse well and are able to kill the microorganism. But then you look at these inhibitory zones, like for example, here's your positive control, that's your negative control, you see that's the disc, which is surrounded by happy bacteria living around it. Whereas the disc that is your positive control, it could contain a very strong antibiotic, let's say that this could be uh, streptomycin, and now the microorganisms do not grow in the area where the compound is present. So you have to look into this. So you determine the two issues. And both of them are going to be important because it gives you an idea of what is the concentration of that particular compound that you need to control the microbial growth. So now, when we think about some of these chemicals that are going to be affecting cell growth, you need to think about that they come in different flavors. We can look at sterilants disinfectants, sanitizers, and antiseptics. And again, we tend to use those terms as synonyms, but they are not. So let's take a look at some of those compounds and um, what are the different functions that they have and how do they work. So let's stay with antiseptics. So both antiseptics and germicides are a chemical agent that is able to kill or inhibit the microbial growth, but they are not toxic enough to be applied to living tissue. Things that we can, for example, apply to our own skin. These are, medically, these are medically important, for example, when you have surgery, because you are removing the uh, compound, you're using the compound to remove the microbials that are in the skin, and therefore not affect the skin that you're losing, uh, using below. So that will be like the topical alcohol that we get. The um, 
what's the name of the alcohol? The isopropyl alcohol that we get on the pharmacy. Uh, it's one of the ones that we apply to the skin all the time, even when we want to do something. So that could work. Iodine-containing uh, compounds, those are the betadine that they use in surgeries, that brown, really deep brown color compound. That is one of the ones used as a topical antiseptic. So now, I'm putting this little uh, box over here to remind you that alcohols, hydrogen peroxide, we use all the, um, hydrogen peroxide all the time, and those iodine-containing compounds, they could be antiseptics, they could be disinfectant, sanitizers, or sterilants, depending on the concentration that you use it. I will not put 100% alcohol in my hands. It's actually quite damaging to your skin. But 70% alcohol we use all the time. So therefore, a compound could be used as an antiseptic at a particular concentration, but not at a higher concentration. So that is an important thing to think about. Now, sterilants are compounds that are able to kill all organisms, including the endospore. And here we have things that we think about, like formaldehyde. We can use formaldehyde to sterilize environments, and that will kill absolutely everything. Disinfectants kill the microbes, but not the spores. So think about a sterilant. When we sterilize something, you're killing everything, including the spores. When you're disinfecting it, you're killing the cells, but unfortunately, you don't kill the spores. So at Sterland, it will be used to remove Clostridium microorganisms, but a disinfectant will not be able to give you the same level of protection in Clostridium species. So you have to be... Yes, Reed? All three of these are under the same thing as antiseptics, or are these a different category? They are, um, and depending on the concentration, is the whole issue. Okay. Yeah. Because, for example, when we think about 85% alcohol, that is not really into an antiseptic, but it can now fall into disinfectant. So remember the issue about the concentration. Um, and last but not least, the sanitizers. These are the stuff that we use in our hands all the time that you uh, use. But again, the sanitizers, again, is the issue that they reduce, but never eliminate microbial numbers down. So they're able to reduce to something that we consider safe. You buy food, and that food, there is a food microbiologist in a company establishing how much is the load of microorganisms that is safe for that product to have. The stuff that you get is not ever going to be microbial free. But there are regulations by the Food and Drug Administration that tells you this amount is acceptable of this particular microorganism. And they do them for a lot of different ones. Imagine a microorganism like Salmonella that is going to have a much lower threshold of acceptance um, versus something that is very innocuous and doesn't do, doesn't do any kind of damage. So they are staf um, staples that determine that kind of issue. So when we think about some of these compounds, again, think about what they're going to be using. So 37%, for example, formaldehyde, we use it as a gas to be a complete and total sterilant and kill spores. But at 3%, in solution is a surface disinfectant. So it goes back to the idea of the concentration that you're having. So you can have hydrogen peroxide. You can use it as a vapor. If you vaporize hydrogen peroxide, you can use it as a sterilant. But you know that you can use that concentration of hydrogen peroxide in a cotton swab when you cut yourself. So you can disinfect the area and reduce uh, the amount of you know, organisms. So it depends on the concentration. One that is really important in Latin America and other places, ozone. Ozone is a really good compound that is able to disinfect drinking water. And when I went to Guatemala, they will have these little ozone machines that will add ozone to the water, and then the water will be safe to drink. So you, are, again, are disinfecting. You're reducing the amount of microorganisms because ozone doesn't remove them all. It's not a sterilant. So remember the issue about sterilants, disinfectants, and sanitizers. How are they different, and what makes them so? Any questions about this part? All right, then let's take another approach. And now let's look at some of these compounds, in particular the antibiotics that we're going to use. So I have a little animation that I'm going to show you. So hopefully it's going to open up over here. And I need to make this big because it's otherwise, uh, there we are, doesn't work. So I'm going to play the first part. And here you have your microbial cell 
with this DNA. And what we're looking over here, as you know, it's ba the basic flow information. DNA is going to go into RNA, and that RNA is going to be translated into proteins by the cell. So what we're going to look is that you can attack the transcription machinery, you can attack the translation machinery, and you can attack the um, cell wall as well as the membrane of the microorganism. Part of the issue that we're always thinking about an antimicrobial agent is what is innate to them that we don't have. Because they are specific molecules, like the gyrus that they have, for example, the ribosomes, are sufficiently different from ours that we can target them uniquely without affecting our own cellular processes. So for example, here's actinomycin, which is a uh, antibiotic, and actinomycin is going to prevent RNA polymerase from finishing transcription. So there we go. You have the molecule, you got your RNA polymerase with the sigma factor coming in. The actinomycin prevents that from going forward and therefore block transcription. Refamping, refamping, excuse me, is another antibiotic, and this one is going to actually bind to the DNA pol RNA polymerase with the sigma factor and prevent it from binding to the DNA. So this is the mechanism of action. So you get the refamping binding to the RNA polymerase and sigma factor. And as you see, it's trying to engage at the promoter, but it's not letting it work and do its job. Now, here we have the translation machinery. We're going to be looking now some of the antibiotics that are used now that are translation inhibitors. And as you know, we have the ribosome composed of two different subunits, the 30S subunit, which is the small, and the 50S subunit, which is the large. Depending on the antibiotic, you can attack either or, as long as the process is the same. So here's streptomycin. And streptomycin, mode of action, it's going to show you over here, is going to prevent the assembly. So here it's going to bind to the small subunit. You got the RNA binding, and now you have the first amino acid. Now you have another amino acid that should be put in there, but it's preventing it from reading it correctly. So it's going to now start making proteins that are going to have a lot of mistakes in them. And those proteins with many mistakes are not functional. Tetracycline, which is one that is commonly used, for example, for skin issues, is able to bind to the A site of the ribosome and here now prevent the tRNA from entering that area and adding the amino acid to its site. Chloramphenicol is another amino acid and this one is going to prevent the formation of a peptide bond. So you see, the right tRNA binds to the um, A site, but now the large subunit is unable to perform the peptide bond formation between the two amino acids present. Here now we're seeing treptomycin, right? Yeah, pyromycin. And pyromycin binds to the A site and basically undergoes a peptide bond with the actual peptide sequestering the protein. That protein is now snug functional. And last but not least, here comes another one. Yeah, erythromycin. And now, as you remember from the process of translation, when the peptide has been added to the T amino, the tRNA that is present on the A site, the ribosome translocates. <coughs> First the heavy chain, have first the heavy subunit, and then the small subunit. So you have this translocation happening. Erythromycin is going to prevent the translocation from happening. Therefore, again, inhibiting protein synthesis. Yes? So the question is, if some of these antibiotics have... Uh, produce a non-functional protein that has a detrimental function to the cell. Sort of like a prion, I'm thinking. I don't know. I don't know. But that is a very good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the organism is dying, so you're not realizing the effect that the protein, the truncated protein may be having in the cell. 
So what you see over here is that the specificity of this compound, especially the ones targeting the ribosome, it's based on the fact that the ribosome and translation in eukaryotes is different from prokaryotes. And therefore they can target prokaryotic uh, translation, but not eukaryotic translation. Oh, the other one. So he's trying to move. I still have a couple of more to show you. So here, let me then stop over there because this is going to introduce you to the families of penicillins. As we have talked about penicillins, they are antibiotics and they target what component? Peptidoglycan, yep, but which part? Say that loud, please. No, not quite. Which process are we targeting with penicillin? It's a peptidoglycan, yes, you're absolutely right. Huh? Transpeptidation, the formation of the peptide bond between the glycan chains. And one common feature of the penicillin family of antibiotics is this beta lactamin ring that you can see here. That square compound. Now, that square compound, it is sensitive to degradation by beta lactamases. And beta lactamases are proteins encoded in antibiotic resistant bacteria that are able to break down the antibiotic and render it useless. So what we're going to see here is penicillin, um, come on, go forward, there you go, penicillin going forward and talking about how it's going to affect the peptidoglycan formation during the uh, cell uh, division. So here you have your peptidoglycan layer, here is taking a look at your glycan tripeptide over there, and here you have your um, amino acids. As you know, the autolysins are breaking the peptidoglycan layer and adding new subunits. And the glycosidases are going to bridge the glycan backbone. But now the FTSI protein is not able to make the protein link between the peptide backbone and therefore renders the peptidoglycan layer very sensitive. So the cell burst during cell division. That's how antibiotics that affect the cell wall um, inhibit cell growth. So anyway, that's the animation. I don't know if I can put this up online for you guys to see it, but I'll try. I think that you can, I can load that fish. So when we look at these microorganisms, you know what? They have many different biochemical functions that are sufficiently different from ours, so we can target them. And those are going to include protein synthesis, either because you're targeting the 50S uh, ribosome or the 30S ribosome. You have um, DNA-directed RNA polymerase, so basically transcription. You have DNA replication, cell wall synthesis, folic acid metabolism, lipid biosynthesis, protein synthesis per se, so you have many points in which the biology of the, UK, of the prokaryote is sufficiently different that we can selectively target that, that process excuse me, with a compound. And again, this is a list of all the antibiotics, so maybe those of you going to pharmacy school will like to actually learn this a little bit more because you're going to be learning about this more uh, in class. I'm not going to ask you to memorize the list for um, our final. But what you need to be familiar, if I mention to you a family, I will tell you what it is, and hopefully you can think about what the mechanism may be or why that is the case. So this brings me up to the next point, the issue about the spectrum of activity. And you have always heard about antibiotic being either a broad spectrum antibiotic. Basically, that defines the types of bacteria that are affected by them. So here in this image. What we have are bacteria, viruses, obligatory parasitic bacteria, and some eukaryotes over there. And what we're looking at here are the different kinds of antimicrobial agents that are being used. So for example, look at penicillins. Penicillins are really good with gram-positive bacteria, but they don't seem to be as effective with gram-negative microorganisms. But now look at tetracycline. A tetracycline is an antibiotic which we consider a broad spectrum because it can affect gram-positive, gram-negative, and some of the intracellular microorganisms that are present in some of those uh, obligatory parasitic diseases. So depending on the type of organism that you're targeting, you need to use a more specific antibiotic. For example, 
Vancomycin is one of the last resort antibiotic types that we're using that targets really well gram-positive microorganisms, but now we're starting to see resistance coming up, like vancomycin resistant stuff and turg. So what we're going to be looking at is that depending on the type of antibacterial, antimicrobial agent, you need to establish what the organism is and understand its biology before you can prescribe as a doctor or as a pharmacist what kind of drug to give to use it. And notice that none of the uh, antibiotics that we use as bacteria are able to affect fungi or affect viruses. So you have to then make sure that you're understanding what kind of agent is the one causing disease to be able to uh, prescribe the medication. So now we have some that are synthetic and some that are naturally occurring. And we're going to be looking at some of these antibiotics. Antibiotics in general, the beta-lactamase antibiotics like penicillins and the cephalosporins, and then some of them that affect uh, other kinds of prokaryotes that are made by prokaryotes. What I bring you the point is the theory from Paul Eldridge. Basically the idea of selective toxicity. You want to have a molecule that is going to affect the target but not affect you. And that is the problem with many of the antibiotics that we have right now. That they are toxic to the bacteria but they're also toxic to us. We tend to use those as last resort, especially with the emergence of antibiotic resistance. So, for example, one of the early uh, antibiotics was the salvarsan, and it was used to fight syphilis. Now, there's also all these other growth factor analogs. Um, for example, look here at uracil. Here is 5-fluorouracil that instead of having a hydrogen there, it has a fluorine atom. That is sufficiently chemically different to allow the RNA polymerase to use that, and actually it will be used in the polymers as well because it's now going to be taken, but now it's making it a toxic molecule. So 5-bromouracil, it will incorporate into DNA instead of thymine, 5-fluorouracil will incorporate into RNA instead of uracil. So they are analogs of molecules that you're going to be having. Sulfa drugs contain these sulfatamine groups. I'm allergic to this, by the way, so know about it. So they inhibit, for example, folic acid synthesis. The quinolones, like Cypro, and if you're taking Cyprox, this is the kind of molecule that you're taking. So they interfere with DNA gyrus. Now, some of these are, some, some of those that I show you are uh, not naturally occurring, but a lot of these microorganisms are able to produce, especially the streptomycetes. They are producing a lot of the molecules that we're currently using, and this is a really large area of research. When we think about the beta-lactamase antibiotics, we think about penicillin. Here's the structure of penicillin once again with the beta-lactam ring. Now that R is going to change according to the naturally occurring penicillin versus the genetically uh, engineer penicillins that we're talking about. So for example, ampicillin, which is commonly used, it's a genetic uh, synthetic modification of penicillin. And you can see the difference in the structure of this acyl group right here versus ampicillin that has now that amine group right there. So very basic modifications can now render an antibiotic more efficient. Yes, sir? Mm, because it may be able to bind to more of the FTA, FTSI isomers present. Yeah. So the penicillin notatum is the microorganism that secretes penicillin. And it was the magic bullet when it was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928 because we started to use it for everything. And we thought that every bacterial disease was going to be ameliorated. Now, for example, when we look at some antibiotics, streptomycin and canamycin, a lot of them are not used medically because of the high toxicity. They're neurotoxic or nephrotoxic, so either the brain or the kidneys get affected. But we use them all in research. And they're able to, these are produced by bacteria, and they're able to inhibit different portions of the bacterial metabolism. So, for example, they target a lot of them ribosome um, and translation. Here is tetracycline. Tetracycline because it has four rings. 
So it's a naphthalene kind of um, antibiotic. We use it still for a lot of skin conditions. Microorganisms are really susceptible to it. And the micro like, like erythromycin, I used to take this before it got um, in disuse. These are really large sugars. Um, so they have a lactone, which is this um, microlite ring over there with the sugar moieties that you can see over there. Now, for the sake of time, let's move over here forward to the fungal agents. And as you know, the problem with the fungus is that they're eukaryotic. They are eukaryotes like us. So molecules that are going to target the fungus are going to also hamper our cells. So what we're looking for, again, is a selective toxicity using pathways like ergosterol inhibition uh, that are going to do something that only the fungus has. And in that case, it's a cell wall. So you can target cell wall metasynthesis. And uh, like, with a, like for example, the glucan synthesis, which is going to make the uh, cell wall of candida, can that kind of targeting that kind of pathway can in, help you fight yeast infections. So depending on the kind of fungus, you can look at chitin biosynthesis, folate biosynthesis, or any kind of microtubule aggregation that is specific for the microorganisms. So again, a lot of antifungal resistant mic uh, mic uh, microbes are coming up. If you talk to Dr. Clarissa Nobile, this is part of their active research, because the thing is that we are over-prescribing again some of these agents. So when we think about a prokaryote, we always have to think about all the pathways that are unique to that fungus that are not present in our cells. So you cannot target, for example, protein synthesis very well because they are having very similar protein synthesis mechanisms as ours. So you have to think about either their cell wall, some of their nucleic acid, particularly if you can uh, look at specific enzymes within their nucleic acid synthesis, as well as microtubule formation. And as we mentioned, this ergosterol synthesis that is going to um, prevent them. Now, the last bit that I want to talk to you about is the issue of an antibiotic resistance. And again, some of you are taking now a class on antimicrobial evolution, or microbial evolution that has to do a lot with antibiotic resistance. But part of the issue, as we mentioned, is that there's a lot of microorganisms that are coming resistant to the drugs that we're currently using. And there are six different reasons why a microbe can become resistant to a drug. Either they lack the organ that the drug is targeting, you cannot target cell wall synthesis. Think about archaea being resistant to penicillins. They do not have the beta lactamase, excuse me, they don't have the uh, FDII gene because they don't have the cell, the same um, structure. The organism may be impermeable to the antibiotic. If the antibiotic cannot get inside the cell where the molecules targeted are present, that microorganism will be resistant. The organism has a way to inactivate the drug, like having the beta-lactamase enzyme that can break down penicillin. The organism may modify the target of the antibiotic, and that modification could be as simple as mutation. A mutation on gyrase, a mutation on the FDI, FTSI gene that will still allow the enzyme to be functional, but now unable to be bound by penicillin, will render that microorganism uh, resistant to it. So that could be also that it can develop another resistant biochemical pathway to the one that you're targeting. And last, they can pump it out. Remember, we talk about the ABC transporters that are efflux porters. Therefore, they're able to pump things out of the cell. So depending on the kind of micro antimicrobial agent that you're using, you can have different modifications. And again, the bane of the penicillin is that beta-lactam ring that can be broken by beta-lactamases. Some other microorganisms are able to acetylate, for example, uh, chloramphenicol in those positions, changing the activity of the antibiotic. Or you can phosphorylate a streptomycin in that phosphate, um, excuse me, in this hydroxyl group right there, and render it also inactive. So different kinds of mechanisms. So when we're looking at this, you can look at a table like this uh, that is going to show you the different mechanisms happening. So you have the reduced permeability, you have the inactivation of the antibiotic, the alter the target that you're using, the pathway that can now it's resistant to it, or the efflux. So look at all these examples and think about no longer 
an example of the antibiotic, but is this is a change that is happening at the chromosomal state, or is a change that is happening because now you have an episomal agent, like a plasmid or a phage, that is now giving that uh, capacity to the organism. Because the thing is, is that, as we discussed, our plasmids, the plasmids that contain this really large arsenal antimicrobial genes are spreadable. And bacteria can pick them up from their environment. So if you look, for example, here at the use of antibiotics and the percentage of resistance strains, look at that antibiotic and look at the number of microbes that are now resistant to it. You can have, for example, tetracycline. There is a very, it's very used medically, but now we're seeing about 80%, over 80% of the strains are resistant to tetracycline. So our arsenal that we're using to combat those microbes, it's diminishing. And then we have other ones like over here, gentamicin. Gentamicin is a fabulous uh, antibiotic, but look, it's toxic to us. So because it's toxic to us, we're not using it a lot. So we use it actually in the lab to kill our own cells for selection. Chloramphenicol is on the rise. And now, if you think about bacteria that can pick up DNA, let's look at, for example, Neisseria gonorrhea, which is a naturally competent microorganism. Here, from the 1980 to 1990, so that is close to 10 years, look at the number of strains of resistance of Neisseria gonorrhea coming up. It went from less than a percent in the early 1980s to now about almost 10% in 1990. I wish I had a more accurate and up-to-date image of this because now what happens is that Neisseria gonorrhea is absolutely resistant to everything that we can throw them at the, from our arsenal. And this is a little bit more now. Um, this figure, it's uh, better from the book. It's, it's updated. And it's basically looking to show you all the organisms that have become resistant and when they became resistant. So Staph aureus has been resistant to antibiotics forever, since the 1950s, and it has been resistant all the way now. But check out every other microorganism, Shigella, Salmonella, Pseudomonas, Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, Salmonella typhi, Microbacterium tuberculosis, Streptococcus pneumonia, Intercoccus faecalis, they're all becoming resistant because of the overuse of um, antibiotics. And some of them, like Staph aureus, it's now resistant to the last resort type of antibiotics, like methicillin. We used to be able to cure staph with methicillin, now we can't. And therefore, the time that it takes for a patient to become cured of an infection with staph aureus depends on the strain that you get. So determining the strain resistance is absolutely important. So as doctors, as pharmacists, when you are in your practice, Make sure that you use those antibiotics only when they are needed and that you ensure that your patients take the entire dose. So um, what we're going to see is that in several of those antibiotics, we can retire them from our arsenal. Maybe now that resistance will be lost and eventually we can come back. But um, that's going to be a difficult test. And the last slide that I want to show you here, I want you to make sure that you learn this part really well. It's how to prevent that antimicrobial drug resistance. So look at the fact that you can immunize to reduce the microbes present. You can avoid the use of unnecessary antibiotic procedures if you need to use it. Identify the target of the pathogen, so you use the right antibiotic to it. So take a look at this table and um, study it well, both of the example and the rationale behind each of these things, all right? Anyway, I'll stop right there. Thank you very much.